We're in the book of Proverbs this morning, chapter 3, if you'll turn there. And if you'll stand with me, please, as we honor God's word, Proverbs chapter 3. And for those of you who are visiting with us today, our Sunday morning uh, approach is this. We've been going through the book of Psalms, and every time we complete five Psalms, we stop and do a chapter of Proverbs, and then we'll do five more Psalms and then a chapter of Proverbs. We're not going to get through this chapter this morning for sure, uh, but we'll do a little chunk of it and It'll probably take us two more weeks, actually, to get through this chapter. But let me read to you beginning in verse 1. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you, will, then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Let's pray, please. Well, Father, again, we're grateful for the Word of God. What a blessing it is to just read it. What a joy it is to consider the truths of God and we ask now, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would indeed glorify Jesus Christ here this morning, and that he, the Holy Spirit, would enlighten the eyes of our understanding, that we might know what is the greatness, Lord, of your power, and of how, Lord, we, the church, are actually your inheritance. You have purchased us with your own blood. So thank you, Father, that you own us. We are no longer our own, thank God, but we've been purchased with a, pr a price and we desire to glorify you. So bless this time as we sit at your table to dine and feast upon the Word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please be seated. I thought it would be helpful to just get a little refresher on what the book of Proverbs is all about. And if you'll turn with me, please, to the book of First Kings, chapter 3, for a moment. Hold your finger there in Proverbs, but 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. 1 Kings chapter 3. It is before 2 Kings, if that helps. You'll find it if you just keep flipping those pages. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 4. Actually, we'll begin in verse 5. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You showed great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord my God, you have made me king instead of my father, father David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. 
And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom, so God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has, has had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Back to uh, Proverbs chapter 1 now, please. Proverbs 1. The reason we just looked at that little story is because Solomon is the one who wrote the majority of the Proverbs. Uh, he wrote many, many more that are rec than are recorded here, but the book is primarily the majority of the uh, book of Proverbs was written by uh, King Solomon. Uh, they've been called the words of the wise, and The book of Proverbs is unique in that it is unlike any other book in the Bible. It offers short, numerous instructions for living a life of wisdom on earth, while other books articulate complex theological truths, like the book of Romans, for example. Or they tell lengthy stories of triumph and failure, or communicate prophetic preaching to disobedient people like the major and the minor prophets. Proverbs focuses on instructing people in the path of wisdom. So it's a very, very unique book. It, it like a laser, focuses in that idea. The theme of the book of Proverbs is found in chapter 1, but... If you'll turn there with me, let me read the first seven verses to you. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair, these Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then the theme of the whole book is found here in verse 7. Fear the Lord, or fear of the Lord, excuse me, is the foundation of true knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? You know, as a young Christian, I didn't like that uh, phrase, fear the Lord, because I thought, I think it means we're supposed to be afraid of God, and that doesn't somehow seem right to me. And so for a long time in my life, I, I really didn't feel as if I had uh, a very good grasp of its meaning, but to fear the Lord refers to the posture of reverence, of worship, and respect that we ought to have towards God. It's giving God what is due to Him. A.W. Tozer, I think, made up a word. He called it the uh, infinitude of God, the immensity of God. 
He fills spatial reality. He's unique. There's no one like him, and we ought to respect him for who he is. It means living our lives in light of what we know of him. So God teaches us, and then we live according to what he has taught us. We hold him in the highest estimation, and we depend on him with a humble trust. So that's what the book of Proverbs is really all about. How do we apply the book of Proverbs? Very simple. We read it, and then we seek to live it. Very simple. We read what it says, and then we seek to live it. So before we even go into chapter 3 this morning, each of us who are believers could, and I encourage all of us to approach this from this perspective, I am going to try and understand what God is saying, and I am, before I even know what he says, I'm going to commit myself to obey him. How about that? Some of you are saying, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, listen, can God, uh, is God out to hurt you? Of course not. Does God make any mistakes? Of course not. Isn't his, aren't his thoughts towards you not evil but good to give you a hope and, and, a, and a wonderful future? Yes. So to have the attitude in our hearts, Lord, teach me and I'm going to do what you're calling me to do. That is active faith. In fact, chapter 3 is entitled Trusting in the Lord. And to trust in the Lord is to have an active faith. It means I understand who he is, I, I understand what he's saying, and by his grace, I'm actively seeking to obey him. That's what it means to trust in the Lord. It does not mean to say, oh, well, I want to contemplate what he's talking, what he said to me. I want to think about it, and oh, that's just grand, and I like all of that, and you leave it at that. It, it, that is a part of it, but it's then putting it into practice. It's easy to do. You trusted when you, when you walked in this building today, you, you acted in a trusting way when you selected your chair and said, I'm going to sit in that chair. You believed that if you sat on that chair, it would not collapse. And it, so far, none of them have. So far. The day's not over yet. It's a simple ex illustration of trusting. Why did, you, why did you unconsciously trust that that chair would hold you up? Well, because you know from youngest days that a chair is made to sit in, and you've sat in chairs your entire life. So you know that a chair functions as something that you can rest your body on. It goes without saying. You're trusting in that. Well, what do you know about God? Same thing. You can trust what God says because you know something of who he is. And so the very first thing that is in this chapter has to do with having a, a healthy life and a life that is marked by being satisfied. He says in verse 1, my child never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. I want to draw your attention in my version. It says my child, but the word my, this two-letter word my, we use that word. Sometimes we'll go, oh my, you know, when we're startled about something or my my. But what is what it's being used in the context here of Solomon speaking to his son and of our father speaking to his children, and it's a word of possession. It's a word of relationship. It's a word 
of ownership. He's saying, my child. Just like when you leave here today, you have your car. You say, well, that's my car, which actually the bank owns, but it's mine right now. It's mine, my car. And so, my child. So the Lord is saying to you, my child, you belong to me. I purchased you with the blood of my own son. You are no longer your own. You, you are my possession. What a beautiful, strong thought to know that I'm not alone here. I belong to him. He considers me as part of his family. I've been adopted into his family so much so that I am a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a stepchild. I am a full-fledged child of God by the grace of God. My child, God is saying to each of us. He's telling us, never forget the things I have taught you. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, it can't mean that we're able to always remember everything that God has taught us, but it's an exhortation to simply not forget the Word of God. Specifically, never forget the things that I have taught you, and God has taught you things in your life. If, if you and I sat down and you got out a notepad and I got out a notepad and we said, well, let's just start writing the things that we know God has really taught us. Well, there'd become a whole bunch of them. And so God is calling you as his child to not forget what he's taught you. And then he says, secondly, store my commands in your heart or accumulate my commands in your heart. The difference between being taught and the heart is understanding and in the heart it's the will. And with respect to the word commands, in today's Christian culture, that's almost a dirty word. And don't ever, from the pulpit, talk about commands. We don't want to hear about commands. That's Old Testament stuff. Well, wait a minute. Jesus in the New Testament said, if you love me, you will obey me. First John, all five chapters deal with obedience to the commands of God. We're commanded to love one another. We're commanded to abstain from fleshly lust. I mean, you could go on and on and on. And so he's saying, you know, those things that I've commanded you to do, you store them up in your heart. So my child, never forget the things I have taught you. Now, how do we remember then and not forget? Well, one of the ways that we remember is by being reminded. And the way we are reminded is by being men and women who are actively and consistently in the Word of God. And as you read the Word of God, you are reminded of what you know, which you had kind of forgotten. Peter, in one of his epistles, says, I know that you know this and are presently established in this truth, but let me stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So God wants to remind us of what we know that we maybe have forgotten, and in that sense, we then never forget what God has said to us, but it demands that we are in the Word of God. And one thing that I would like to just throw in, not throw in here, but say it is, it is supremely important, we can get trapped into this Bible reading mentality uh, where we're, we're just going to read through the Bible in a year and, and we're going to just do that and accumulate, you know, this knowledge of God. But really, what is the purpose of reading the Bible and studying the Bible? What is God's purpose for you and I 
in really getting into the Word and being men and women who don't forget the things of God. It is so that we might know the Lord. The entire push of the Bible is towards Him. It's towards Jesus Christ. It is to enable us to understand the, it is to, to know the unknowable and to have that communion with him, that real fellowship with him, to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if you approach the Bible from that perspective and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to read my Bible, but help me, to, help me to know you through the Bible. I can guarantee you, and I don't work for men's warehouse, I can guarantee you that God will honor that, that prayer in your life. You know why? Because he wants you to know him. You know why he wants you to know him? Because when you know him, you are being conformed into the same image from glory to glory. Your contact with God, if you will, transforms your life more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. You bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He loves you. This is God we are talking about here. Almighty God, the eternal God, the Godhead, the three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, all of whom had no beginning and have no end. That God, who has provided a way, not a way, but the way for sinful man to be redeemed. He sent a mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died upon a cross. He bore the sins of all persons who've ever been born, whoever will be born. He paid fully and satisfied the justice of God. Because God does not want you to perish. He takes no delight in the death of the wicked. He says to the wicked, turn, turn from evil. You come to me. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants you to be saved, but being saved, he wants you to grow. Oh, it's beautiful to see a little baby, isn't it? A little, yeah, you see these little kids, little TV ads are just so sweet. You know, they're six months old or two months, six, eight, whatever it is. And then if you saw them again in five years and they looked the same, you'd say, what's the matter with that kid? Is he stunted or what? Well, many Christians are like that. They're saved, but they haven't grown. And the reason they haven't grown is because it's something to do with their heart. Oh, they understand, but it's the heart, it's the will. And may I say with, I was talking with one of our sweet ladies here today, may I say with as much kindness and gentleness as I'm able to, we as Christians are living in a Christians in a society unlike the society that existed before the advent of the radio. That began the change of letting something into the home. Not bad things necessarily. All kinds of programming and the family would now gather around the radio and would spend much of their time around the radio. And then with the advent of the television, a whole new form of communication. And now families would spend their time watching the television. And now with the internet, family members can be in the same room 
holding their precious device and your spouse or your child is over there holding their precious device and we're communicating with whatever. And families, by and large, no longer, individuals and families no longer hold this book in the regard which our forefathers, whose shoulders we could stand upon, used to. They used to hold this book in high regard, the Holy Bible. And families would have Bible times together. Parents would teach their children. They would catechize their children, teaching them the doctrines of the Bible. And husbands and wives would spend time together praying together, reading the Bible together. And now we don't have the time to do that. Did you know that it takes only 70 hours to read at a moderate pace? You'll read the whole Bible in 70 hours. If you broke that down over 52 weeks, five days a week, 20 minutes a day, you can read through the whole Bible in a year. It's amazing when you really stop and break it all down. But we don't have the time to read the Bible because we've been, you know, just drawn into this culture along with the unsaved world. There's really no difference much of the time. And not only are we occupied with the television and the internet, but the content of what we're occupied with no longer makes us blush. Blushing is a lost function within the bodies of most people today. And we know when something is wrong. And it's always, it's, I mean, sex is at the top of the list. You go through the Bible, it's always at the top of the list. The commercials. You know, Ozzy and Harriet slept in separate beds. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> Single beds. They wore pajamas. What a life. Now everybody's sleeping in everybody's bed. People don't even know what sex they are. Friends, we are living in confusing times. God is saying to you, my child, don't forget what I've taught you. How do you remember what he's taught you? By reminding yourself, getting into the word, coming to church, making church attendance a priority and not letting the world mold push you into its mold. And then in the heart, saying, wait a minute, God has commanded me to abstain from sexual immorality. Well, I'm not out having an affair. I don't have a girlfriend. Well, yeah, but you know what? I know when that commercial comes on, yep, there it is. That's, oh, that's terrible. Oh, there it is. There's no abstaining from it. It's sin. It's wrong. God says, don't do it. But we've just somehow grown accustomed to it, and it's no longer an issue. And then we wonder, well, why is my life not satisfied? You know, when you were little and learning how to dexterity and learning how to pick things up and put them where they belong, little toys and putting a star here and a square here and a round peg in a round hole. They each only go where they belong. God belongs in our hearts in terms of being reverenced and worshipped and acknowledging his greatness and storing his commands in our heart. My, what a 
my, what a contagious group of people a church can become if they mortify the sin in their life, putting off the flesh and putting on the new man in the book of Colossians, and really seeking to live the Christian life. My, my, what a change. And you know what the change is according to this verse? It is that you will have a satisfied life. You will have a healthy life. You will have a satisfied life. In verse 3, he says, Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart so then you will find favor with both God and people and you will earn a good reputation. He's still speaking to my child, but he's saying now, here's something, never let this happen. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you, which implies they could. And it implies that we need to give ourselves to being loyal people and to being kind people. You know, a one little illustration of loyalty to me would be when I see a pastor friend of mine or, you know, that I haven't seen for a while, that I can look him right in the eye and not feel any guilt that, oh, <laughs> sure glad he doesn't know what I said about him last week. That's disloyalty. It's betrayal. It's a tremendous virtue to be loyal. And, and one of the ways that I think we can be loyal is by being accountable one to another. I thank God for my wife, whom I often, you know, make little jokes about, but when she says things to me, you know, like, honey, nothing is ever easy with you. If you forget something, it's not a simple, you forgot where it is. It's, it, it involves, you know, calling in the militia to find it. And I always say, well, honey, make a note of that, and you can share that at my funeral. She says, honey, it's going to be a long one. And I was thinking, yeah, three hours. She said about three days. How I got from loyalty to that, I don't know, but... Uh, oh, yes. Being able to be accountable. I appreciate our executive pastor, Mike Buford. I trust Mike. And I can share with him you know, sometimes in ministry, you have this thing, don't ever be friends with people. Stay away from them. <laughs> what? <laughs> I appreciate being able to be able to share my heart with somebody and be prayed for. I, I said to uh, one of our sweet ladies here again today, I said, by the way, I called one of our elders the other day to apologize for being a little cranky the other day when I was invited into his meeting. Boy, did he yell at me when I called him to. He said, oh, cranky isn't the word. No, no, he was very gracious. But you know, when we know something isn't quite right, we should make it up. Get it straightened out. Don't let loyalty leave you. And kindness. You know, one of the ways that kindness, I believe, can be expressed is when you're talking with someone that you really don't want to talk with. You never want to talk with them. We all have people like that. And when you're talking with them, you're really not listening. You're, you just can't wait for it to be over. And you're kind of looking around and saying, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the whole time you're listening, you're not really listening. You're just being, you know, apparently polite. And they can tell most of the time. 
But what a, what a wonderful thing it is to say, you know, I'm going to listen to this person. I'm going to pay attention to this person. I want to be kind to this person. I don't, I don't like them, but that doesn't matter. I can be kind to them. I know that when people I respect listen to me, they're being kind to me, it encourages me to no end. And if there's one thing we need, it's encouragement. Like, you all are so kind. You don't like me, but you listen to me. And you come back every week. And you're kind, and God won't forget that. <laughs> but he says, don't let loyalty and kindness leave you. We can become cynical. We can become, you know, uh, too quick to speak, harsh, unkind. We're to be tender-hearted. Tie them around your neck. I mean, what's that? Well, it's a reminder for what? You know, I mean, he's saying, look, make an effort because then here's what will happen. You will find favor both with God and again, God honors people who honor his word. He honors you. I mean, you're a businessman. You have employees. That's a hard job. You're trying to make a living, and it's not easy to be kind to people who maybe aren't doing their job properly. And you've got to have wisdom. But if you seek to do what God has called you to do, he will honor you. And you will, you will have favor with people. People will recognize that about you and you will earn a good reputation. We all have people we admire because of the way they act. And then a favorite verse of so many, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, or acknowledge him in all your ways, New King James Version, then you, excuse me, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. So here he's telling us what to do and how to do it and what not to do and what will happen if we follow those instructions. What to do is trust in the Lord, in the person of God with all your heart. That speaks of submission. You know, we just sang uh, this song a while ago, and here I am to worship, and here I am to bow down. I mean, we can sing it all day long, but th do you know those words, what they mean? Here I am to worship or to prostrate myself before you, almighty God, and to bow down before you. That's trusting in the Lord with all of your heart. And then what not to do, and don't lean to your own understanding. We just have these two options every day. Don't lean to your own, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll figure this out. I, I can do this. I'll straighten this out. I'm going to get it, you know, instead of, Lord, I've got a problem here. Would you please lead me? Because if you trust in him with all of your heart and you determine to not take it into your own hands and your conscience, our consciences, hate those consciences sometimes, don't you? Huh? Come on now. Preach it, brother. <laughs> They're there for a reason. If we do this, God says, I'll show you where to go. I'll guide you. It means he'll clear the path. He'll make sure you don't fall into the pothole there and you don't get hung up by this branch that's on the road or whatever. God will guide you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing that God would do.
And then in closing in verse 7 and 8, this is really in closing until we begin the next portion of the message. This just closes out the first section of it. No, verse 7, oh my, don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Oh, can I tell you, let you in on a little secret about my younger days as a Christian? I, sh I wish I had read this because I, and I maybe still have a problem with this, but uh, I, I consciously used to think a lot of myself. And I would compare myself with other people, and I would say, well, I'm doing this because I, I'm, I'm just sharper than that person. Oh, God must have just been laughing and laughing and laughing, saying, really? Well, just stick around, Bob. We've got some education for you. Pride. That's why a novice should never be put into a position of leadership. They're not broken men yet. Every man that God wants to use, he must break him severely. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Those two things, respect God and run for the hills from evil. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. The evil one, it's the same point here. Turn away from evil. My goodness, what a different kind of a Christian we can be according to the Word of God. Don't you think? Do you agree? I mean, this is what Christianity is. I have conversations with Christian pastors and friends, and we are realizing so many things about the pitiful state of our own lives and of how we've accommodated the culture into our lives. We're to be sober. It doesn't mean we can't. Listen, laughter is good medicine, joy, and so on. But the, the being sober, it says in First Peter, be sober for the time of the, these are the end days. And he says in verse 8, then, if, you, if you'll do that, then, notice, you will have healing for your body. You'll be healthier and strength for your bones. Our attitude affects our health. Doesn't mean if you're sick that there's something spiritually wrong. But just in general, your attitude determines your outlook. If you've got a godly attitude, you're going to have some spring in your step. You're going to be healthier. Bad attitudes hurt the mind, the soul, etc. Well, we'll stop right there, okay? You all are saying, amen, Pastor Bob. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. You still answer prayer, God. <laughs> he said he was going to quit, and he did. Well, I'm a rebel. Let's go on. <laughs>